It says, And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please, let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. So this is a piece of metal that fell in the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. I'm going to come back to this story at the end of my message. But this morning, this uh, Father's Day morning, I want to preach a message titled, The Five-Star Man. The Five-Star Man. Now you understand why I'm dressed in a suit. <laughs> That's why. Okay? I want to talk about the five-star man. The concept of five-star is a concept you use to rate uh, facilities, especially hotels. All right, uh, that's the idea. It represents excellence. It represents outstanding performance. Uh, five star is not, because this day and age, we're in the world of reviews. So people think that when they say something is a five star hotel, they are saying that it gets five star reviews. That's not the issue. Your review is not the issue. There is a, there's an industry standard uh, that, that defines what is five star, what is three star, what is two star. I'm already preaching. Just stay with me. All right? So there is a standard of measurement. Uh, it has nothing to do with your opinion. It has nothing to do with what people say. It is, there is a rating. There is a system. Um, and it reminds me, um, my wife this morning, she is not here because, in case you don't know, she's in a, in a country where she's from. Um, I always say that me and my children are Canadians. <laughs> she is from one country like that. So she's there this morning. And because she abandoned me on Father's Day, <laughs> and tomorrow, which is my birthday, I'm going to tell this story. <laughs> she will not be happy about this story, but I will tell it. So that she, next year, she'll remember that she cannot abandon me <laughs> on Father's Day. So 12 years ago, uh, when I was going to marry my wife, we had to go to our hometown, which is Lokoja in, in Nigeria. Now, if you don't know Nigeria, uh, there are two or three states in Nigeria that we can say are, you know, fairly, you know, very nice, okay? Um, some people will argue, but really, that's what it is. There's just three or four places that I will advise you to go if you are going to Nigeria, <laughs> all right? Uh, every other place, there's always you know, one thing or the other that you have to deal with. And Lokoja is one of those places that is not yet as developed as other places, even though it is very close to the state capital, which is Abuja. Um, it's just a few hours' drive from Abuja, actually. But when you get to Lokoja and you see Abuja, there are two different places. Uh -huh. Abuja right now is the closest thing that we have to the Western world. Okay? You are getting an education in Nigeria. Just stay with me. So she's in Lokoja right now because that's where her parents live. So when we wanted to get married, I needed to go with my whole family. This is what we do in Nigeria. My whole, my generations, basically, everybody, everybody, all my friends, I had bosses. And it's not a joke, like, everybody. I had to carry my, all my family, my, my extended family, everybody went with us. Um, because they want to see that I'm not alone. Before they release their wife to me, you know, they want to see that I have backing, you know. So all of us went. But what I didn't know was that when they say hotel in Lagos, <laughs> it's very different from when they say hotel in Lokoja. So I just told the, the uh, elder sister, you know, book us a nice hotel that is close to the venue, right? We had found this field that had mountain backdrops. It was going to be all very nice and cute, right? So we said, just leave her with the hotel business. Let her book the hotel. And she, she went ahead and booked the hotel. <laughs> <sighs> I can never forget that experience of that hotel. <laughs> you know, there's five star, there's three star, and there's no star. <laughs> This hotel does not have any destiny. He had no style whatsoever. It was nothing, nothing. Like from the outside, it didn't look too bad. But, but from, right from the get-go, the smell was not okay. The rooms were not okay. In fact, in fact after we got married, this is the part that really pains me. This is why I'm sharing this story. Uh, at, the, at that hour of the night, when the man just got married to his wife, and there's about to be a divine visitation, <laughs> my friends who we took to the hotel were knocking on our door <laughs> to say that there's no power, that the power is going out. So in my mind, I was asking that, are we not in the same hotel? Don't they know that I know that there's no power? Like, what, what is this? So that was the experience of my wedding night, so I'm telling you. It was in this hotel. So from that day, 
Uh, lead, needless to say that I don't trust her sister to book anything for me again. <laughs> Nothing. So anytime, <laughs> anytime, as she was going to the locker journal, I told her, I said, have you, have you gotten internet? She said, yes. Do you have generator? She said, yes. Don't trust her to book anything for you. <laughs> if you book it, it's going to be terrible. So that's how hotels are. But you know, after that, we've, we've had the privilege of staying in other hotels, right? And we've seen that, okay, there's a difference. Now, when we say five star, some of you will say, oh, yeah, I know that hotel that I went to is a five-star hotel. The truth of the matter is that a lot of us in our lifetime may never be in a five-star hotel um, because they are very, very few, extremely few. They are fewer than you think they are. Most of the hotels you've stayed in are most likely three-star hotels. If you open the door and everything looks good and you say, yeah, this is better than my house, it's probably a three-star hotel. Yeah. The ones that are really, really good, like that really, really good, that are vacation destinations are four-star hotels. Um, and I will convince you. Okay, before I get into the Bible, I'm already preaching. If you are paying attention, I'm already preaching. But before, so that you don't argue about your next vacation, okay, I'll tell you what a five star hotel is supposed to have. Then you tell me whether the ones you have been in have, have these things. Okay, a five star hotel, because the point I'm trying to make is this uh, when we define things, we don't define things by people's opinion or people's rating, we define them by a standard. There is a measure. So a five star hotel must have a personal butler for you, must have a dumb man. <laughs> No, okay, so you see that you have already deleted yourself from me. <laughs> Must have a designated concierge, a round-the-clock room service, valet parking, spas with trained masseuses, gym with personal trainers, live entertainment. So they're not playing music. There is a band that is playing, 2-4. So you have a place that you can go. So this is what... They must have childcare, five-star hotel. An assortment, not one pool, of heated pools and hot tubs. Saunas and steam rooms, dance halls, golf courses, game rooms. So you see, I wasn't insulting you when I said you might never be in a five-star hotel. <laughs> All right, so those are, the, those are the few things. It also goes on, it says bar options, you must have top-rated chefs with personalized menus. So as I get to the hotel, they have to ask me what my dietary menus are. So my pounded yam must be available, my edika icon must be available. Things like that. That's what a five-star hotel is. Literally, that's what it is. So all of these things. Each room must be spacious, potentially featuring separate living rooms, patio, kitchen, mini bar, a personal jacuzzi, designer bathrobes, high end toiletries. Who wants to go on vacation already? You know, I, I read this thing and I'm like, wow, this is this sounds like it. Well, this is the point I'm, where I'm going. As it is with hotels, so it is with men. So when, when I say five-star man, what I'm talking about is not how you define yourself. It's not how people have defined you. People may have experienced you and said, ah, that guy is five-star because they gave you a review. You say, ah, he speaks well, he looks good, he dresses well, all of that is five-star. No, five-star is there are five things in the scripture that biblically define a man. It's been a long time I preached a message that was not three points, but this one is five points. There's nothing I can do about it. So there are five things in the scripture that biblically you can use to define a man. A real man is not measured by, by opinions. It's not measured by worldly standards. It's not measured by how impressive you are when you arrive. It's not measured by there was the, one of the first billboards we did when we, when we started the church was it's not what you drive, it's what drives you. So, so those are the things that we use to measure people. But this is how the Bible defines a man. So a successful combination of these five things, just like we, when we rate hotels, a successful combination of all of those things that are listed that makes a five-star hotel is what can make us define somebody as a five-star man. So you might, be, you might be a lady and saying to me, okay, maybe I came to the wrong service today. Um, I'm a single lady. What does this have to do with me? This will help you more than you think. Because now you will know what exactly you are supposed to be looking for. Uh -huh. in a, I'm telling you, you have, to be, you have to be smart. Now, when you get married to, to a man, it might be one star at the beginning, okay? And you will understand it when I list all the five things to you. It might just have one of these qualities. But just like when you see ratings, when they give somebody one star rating, there is still the space for the remaining four. Which means that even if he has a one star rating, there has to be potential for all four to be complete. Do you understand what I'm saying? This person must be working towards fulfilling, blocking that gap. And it's not that, you know, I, I'm just, this is who I am. You have to take me as I am or don't, don't. No, 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 no. This is where I'm starting from, but this is not the bus stop. Do you understand this? 
You are married as a lady. You say, okay, what am I doing in Father's Day meeting now? What am I going to do about it? I've already married this man. It will, it will help you not to chase him away, but to, to understand that there is gaps in, in our, in, as a man, you know, one of the, the biggest things for men is we find it difficult to ad admit the areas where we're weak. And it takes a, a godly woman that is very smart to, to see those gaps and to help the man to fill those gaps without making him ashamed of those gaps. Can I say that again? The best wives, the best wives, are the ones that understand their husband's weaknesses. They can see it, but they are not throwing it at his face. They are strategically positioning themselves to help him to fill those gaps. Because at the end of the day, if he manages to become a five-star man, who stands to benefit the most from it? You, not even the kids, not even your children. You are the first person that will benefit from that. So that's how it affects you as a lady, all right? Now, all of these five things that I'm going to share today all begin with the letter P, okay? Just because I'm a pastor. <laughs> and this is what preachers do. So everything begins with P. The first thing is this, write this down. The first thing that biblically defines a man is the word priest. Priest. Now, you hear this and immediately you say, oh, well, I'm not a pastor, so this doesn't apply to me. No, priest doesn't mean pastor. Priest does not mean pastor. Uh, the job of the priest in the scripture was to keep the people in a position where they can receive from God. Please write that down. That's very important. The job of the priest was to keep the people in position to receive from God. There are so many P's. You should not forget this. Okay? Keeps people in position to receive from God. That is the definition of a priest. And every single man that is a godly man has to be a priest. In fact, I dare say that this is the most important of all the five because every other thing flows out of priesthood. Everything else. Exodus chapter 18 verse 1. Let me try to explain this to you. There's a man here named Jethro. He was, he was Moses' father-in-law, but the Bible makes it very, very clear to us that he was a priest, and there's a reason for this. He says, And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, when you go down to verse 17, it's almost like now we see the reason why the scripture mentions to us that this man is a priest, because he understands priesthood, and he understands the role of the priest. So he says to Moses here, when Moses started to do counseling for the whole bunch of the people and he was wearing himself out. Verse 17, he says, so Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you, you are not able to perform it by yourself. This is why God gave Adam Eve in the first place. Because it is, too, it is not good, the Bible says, for man to be alone. Verse 19 says, listen now to my voice. In other words, listen to the voice of the priest. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. What is the job of the priest? Stand before God for the people. So that you may bring their difficulties to God. That is part one of the job of a priest. Part two. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. So this is the two-dimensional role of the priest. And in the New Testament, every single one of us have been made kings and priests. You are first the priest over your own life and then the priest over the family, the immediate family that God has given you. Because, I mean, for those of you who have done 201, you've heard me say this to you. That before you do help other people solve their problems, what do you need to do? Solve, solve your own problems first. That's the beginning point. So you, you solve your own problems. So you have to first be a priest who is standing before God. This is the beginning. You stand before God and then you bring the difficulties of the people to God. And then by that interaction, you can get information from God that you now go to teach the people, which is the way that they must work and the work that they must do. So what does this look like for a family is what we've said. Stand before God for your family. Bring their difficulties to God. Show the way they must walk and the work they must do. If you, are, if you are a single and you are a brother in the house, this is the best time for you to start to practice priesthood. Before you bring other people into the mix, 
you have to master the art of priesthood. There is nothing else, according to the scripture, that defines a man that does not flow out of priesthood. Job said uh, in Job chapter 1, I mean, Job gets a lot of bashing, but there's something very instructive here that we can learn from his behavior, okay? From verse number 4, Job 1 verse 4. It says, and his sons, in other words, Job's sons, will go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and will send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So they were having parties. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, when they finished their partying, Job will send and sanctify them. This is what a priest does. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. There is, a, there is a burnt offering in the Old Testament. There is a burnt offering in the New Testament. Okay. Did that fly over your head? Okay. I hope you know that New Testament, we're not offering goats and rams. All right. Okay. I just want to make sure. Verse 5. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus Job did regularly. This is what a priest does. So even if the, the children are doing what they like, they're not behaving the way they are, he's not going after the children, trying to bash them up. He is going before God, bringing the difficulties to God, and then doing his best to teach them the way they must walk and the work they that do. they must do. This is what a priest does. Now, in the new covenant, it's not out of fear of evil that we offer burnt offerings of praise and sacrifice and thanksgiving to God. It is out of the fear of God. So we are not offering sacrifices like Job was doing here. He was doing this out of fear because later on we saw him say that the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. Yeah. So you don't do it out of, the, out of the fear of evil. You do it out of the fear of God, the reverence of God. That I don't know what these people are up to in this family. I have to, my job as the priest is to keep us in line so that we can, we can stay under the covering of the favor of God. Stay under that blessing. Uh, like we were, we were reading yesterday, um, uh, on last Sunday, I say yesterday when I, when I preached because that's the last time I preached. So just understand that. So, so I, was, I, was, I was talking about how the Bible says that uh, evil spirit from, from God came upon Saul. Right? If you study that out, what it's really saying is that the, God took away his hand from him. Because this world that we live in is cursed. If God takes away his favor from you, the only thing that will be evident is the curse. That is the default mode of the earth. Do you understand this? So, so we are keeping ourselves in line is, is so that the favor and the hand of God that is upon us stays upon us. And this is where the problem of man began. Because at the beginning, Adam did not understand his role as the priest. Adam was, was the priest, was put in charge of that garden, but he, he took his role very lightly. And many, many of us men are doing the same thing today. Because Satan will always be the priest of a home that is priestless. I'm not saying a home that doesn't have a man. You can be there. You can Look, masculine gender is different from priesthood. So when the priest of the house is silent, Satan speaks. So Satan went to the wife because Adam had not instructed her the way she must walk and the work she must do. If they had, they had had a conversation like Ananias and Sapphira, they would have ended up in the same place. Uh -huh. Because again, you bash them, but they were in agreement. Even though they were in agreement for evil. Perfect agreement. Husband said one thing, died. Wife said the same thing, same result. So if Adam had done the exact same thing with Eve, there would have been an understanding. And Satan would not have had to come to say, did God really say? Because this is always going to be the question he will ask you. Did God really say? And for your, for your, 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 your wife, your children, to repeat exactly what God said, it means you are, you are presenting it to them regularly. You are saying it to them regularly. You are letting them understand that these are the statutes of God. Even though your, your children go to other people's homes, they come back and say, but in Nathan's house, they do that. Say, I don't care what they do in Nathan's house. In this house, this is what we do. It's as simple as that. So you are supposed to speak over your family on behalf of God. Otherwise, Satan will do this for you. And this is the first job of a man. This is the first thing that makes a man a five-star man. Number two is this. A five-star man is a prophet. A prophet. If you listen to me the first, the, for the first point, you understand that I'm not talking about the person that stands and declares, thus says the Lord. All right? So when we say prophet, what we are saying is, here is where we are going. A five-star man is a man that, that understands direction. He can give direction. The reason he can give direction is because he is standing before God. Because he is, first of all, a priest. He can provide leadership. 
he has a knowing and a leading of a better place. The, the whole picture might not be perfectly clear. He might not know all the steps to get there, but there is a sense of direction. There is a sense of purpose. There is not aimlessness, like, like um, uh, my wife has been telling me a lot of stories. When she comes, please tolerate her. She'll be speaking with a lot of vengeance. <laughs> because I told her, I said, maybe the first message you will speak when you come back is, is uh, against neg negative confession. Because she said, everybody's just cursing and swearing negative confession. Like, here is only F word that everybody agrees on that they can use to curse. There, there are so many things. <laughs> Different variations of words that are, like, it's, it's almost like the vocabulary is just, so she was, she was telling me that, that there's a lot of people that are just aimless. Like able-bodied men that wake up in the morning and say because they have sent resume, they don't have a job, they just wander around aimlessly, aimlessly. Um, that is the, the kind of man that has one star and doesn't have space for the remaining four. Do you understand what I'm saying? Look, I, I, tell, I tell single ladies, you know, I'm, I care about the ladies because you are more delicate than a man can make some mistakes and still recover. Okay, am I talking already? Uh -huh. It's possible for a single guy to make a lot of mistakes and recover in a way that a lady may not be able to. It takes more work for a lady to recover from making several mistakes in choosing a, a spouse than for a guy. So I don't really care too much about the guys. Those that are really close to me, I tell them my secrets. But you see, don't marry a man that is aimless. You know what they call couch potato? You know couch potato? Wakes up in the morning. The first thing he wants to do is play PS5. First thing in the morning. You are, you are going to deal with that for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, you know, they were saying that, you know, they started Euros now. They are playing European Championships. One of the coaches of one of the teams had to ban PlayStation from the players' rooms. Grown men, though, they brought PlayStation to the camp. Yeah. Because anything can become an idol. Anything at all. Look, it doesn't matter what it is. Anything at all can become anything that you are doing in, in, in excessive measure, in compulsive measure, that you have no control over. The other day, I was standing in front there. You know, a, the city came and brought, put a sign out there, no smoking sign. So a fellow was standing right. If I took in a picture, you would have seen the sign behind his head, no smoking. So I was, I was talking to the dude, and I said, can you see that sign? Do we need to change the language of this thing? Maybe we need to do that. Uh, that it, it just, but it has a symbol that says no smoking. Do you know what he said to me? He said, I have to smoke. Ah, but I have to. Ah, you know, the minute he said the compassion came on me. You know, the anger had just floated away. I just realized that there is a problem. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is a problem. Anything you have to do is a problem. <laughs> I have five points today. I can't, I can't afford to beat about the bush. <laughs> Genesis chapter 22. Let me read this story to you of, of Abraham. Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his, his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he, he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we'll come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. Pay attention to verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? for a burnt offering. Like we learned yesterday from the men's, the men's conference that we joined, Abraham did not say, shut up, young man. You don't question your father. Uh -huh. Because that's not the sign of, 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 of fatherhood. You are a prophet. You have to give direction. When they ask you questions, it's because they are looking for direction. So you give answers. Do you understand what I'm saying? You give answers per time based on what you know. It is not, they don't need to make anything up. Look at what Abraham said. Go, go, go. Is that where we have verse number, verse number eight? It says, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. This, at this stage, was all that Abraham could come up with. But he had to come up with some kind of direction. 
this is the last instruction that God gave us, is to go up to the mountain. How God will take care of us there, it has to be up to him. Do you understand? So when we are saying that a, a, a five-star man is a prophet, we are not saying that he has all the answers. We are not saying that he knows everything from beginning to the end. No. But you have to be certain in God's ability. Not because you know how God will do it, but because you know the God that you are dealing with. Yes. That only comes from priesthood. This is why I keep saying that that is the beginning of this journey. If you, if you, if you refuse to embrace that, every other thing flows out of that. So, so that's where you get your confidence from. That's where you get your direction from. Because, uh, look, ask anybody, ask any woman that's sitting beside you this morning. No woman wants to follow a man that doesn't have direction. No woman wants to be married to a man that is aimless, that doesn't have vision. Look, even if, even if you have to go and copy and paste somebody else's vision at the beginning, I'm telling you, you have to appear like you know where you are going. You have to. Uh, when, when, I'm, when I talk about, I mean, my wife and I now, we are, we are almost at 20 years of, of being together. So this is not, I mean, we've been married for 12, but we've been together literally almost 20 years now. And this is the, the, the one thing that she, she keeps saying is, at the time that she met me, even though I did not look like somebody that had any hope, I sounded like one. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. You will not come and ask me, I, I may not know the answer to all the questions, but even at the end of the day, I mean, I don't do that. Uh, that's a good question. Because once you say that you have accepted <laughs> defeat, I, just give me some time. Give me some time. I will find the answer. Uh -huh. So what's your five-year plan? At that, at that point, what concern me concerning five-year plan? I don't have. But say, don't worry. In another five years, I'll be all that God wants me to be. You, you have to provide an answer. You cannot be. You get what I'm talking about. You cannot just be aimless. Say, uh, if I, ah, I'm just taking it as it comes. Oh. Uh, one day at a time, oh. And just taking it as it comes. So your priesthood is the foundation for being a prophet. You must have the word. Look, we cannot stop going back to this thing about the word of God. Um, if you are not somebody that understands that God speaks to you through the word, through the spirit of God, and through the prophet of God, you will, you, this thing called direction would elude you. Psalm 119 verse 105. Let, let me break this scripture down to you a, a little bit. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. There are two things here that the word of God is. It says, it is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let me paint the picture for you. If you, if you carry a lamp, all right, what he's saying is this, that the word of God, literally, this is what it is. The word of God is a lamp to my feet. That is short term. It is a light to my path. That is, yeah. So, so you, must, you must have both. So at the, at the minute, even though you don't have all the, everything figured out, there must be a light that is on your feet to take the next step. But what the word of God also helps you to do is to look ahead of time and see where the results of, if you sit down with yourself and look into the mirror and ask yourself this question. The way I'm living my life right now, what would my life look like in 20 years? If I continue on this, Path. That's why it says the light to my path. If I continue on this current path that I am on, huh, what will my life look like in 20 years? Again, my wife was telling me that, you know, you know again, when you get to Nigeria and the, the fact that there are not many people that have you know, some of the advantages and privileges, when they see you, the first thing that comes to their mind is you are, you are where you are or you know, the way you are uh, because you, you traveled abroad. So she always has to remind them that my advantage is not that I traveled abroad. If you bring, in fact, she, she, said, she said this and I loved it. When she said it, I just smiled. I said, I married correct. You know when you say you married, cor cor I married correct. She said, if you take me and my husband away from Canada, bring us back to Nigeria, we will reproduce exactly what you are seeing in this country. Because the blessing is on the inside. It's on the inside. The word of God is the light to your feet, is the lamp to your In fact, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, you know, this ministry that we are doing here is, is way easier to do this thing called ministry back in my, in my own country. Way easier. The Nigerians know what I'm talking about. Way, I don't have to deal with government rubbish. I don't have to deal with signing paper, doing, what's AGM? AG what? What's that? <laughs> you are not accountable to anybody. You can do whatever you like. Nobody is going to police you, except you get in trouble. <laughs> except you just overdo it. And you get into foolishness, right? So it's way easier to do that. So I tell them, I say, the word of God is our advantage. And we have been buried in this word. Even before we met each other, you heard her tell you our own testimony. We're separate events, nothing to do with the fact that we were together. 
The person that I wanted to marry, I tried to buy, find, find Bible, sit her down, let's study the watch, she'll be, she'll be yawning. I said, this one, I can't marry you. Yeah, I can't marry you. No, I can't marry you. So this is what the word of God does. And, and you are here, you are a young man. That you are thinking to yourself, what is the advantage of me sticking with the word? It, it's the same Psalm 119. If you go up to verse 9, it tells you your own part of this thing. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Your own priority right now as a young man in the house is to cleanse your way. That is your priority. Look, <clears throat> I'm, I'm telling you guys, look. Ladies, <clears throat> they say they love you, they love you. you know, I, I'm telling you that you are my own priority. The guys, they can take care of themselves. Say they love you, they love you. Come and sleep with me. Very easy. That one is very easy. Just ask them, do you love your mom? You know where we're going with that, right? Uh-huh. So just, just ask him that question. When you ask him that, his body will calm down. Uh-huh. Because they're always coming up with all sorts, of, all sorts of things. The issue here is, if you find a young man, and I'm saying this because I, I have been one. <laughs> Before I got married, I was a certain way. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you find a young man who cannot exercise self-control, huh? and you are encouraging his lack of self-control, you will deal with the repercussion when you get married. My wife has been gone now for how long? Almost two weeks now. She's not worried that her husband will be caught somewhere under the bridge with a girl inside the car. No concern. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we have practiced self-control. It's not like, and she saw it. So it's not that with her. It's not like maybe they told her that, oh, that guy will be faithful to you. Do you get what I'm talking about? This is what you do. So that's your priority as a young man. Then when you get married, because marriage is not this uh, 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 ticket to unlimited, uh, uh, you know, it's just this brainwave that when I get married, I can do whenever I like, anyhow I like, however I like, oh boy. When reality hits you, <laughs> let me stay with my message. <laughs> Point number three. I think I'm doing well for time right now. So let me, let me maintain that. The five-star man, number three, is a patriarch. A patriarch. What does that mean? Simply means first in line. That's the, the simple way to explain it. He understands that God is a God of generations. Therefore, he is a God of legacy. That it is not all about me. I am only first in line. I am a custodian of certain things for those that are coming behind me. And you have to have this understanding because God is a God of Abraham. He is a God of Isaac and a God of Jacob. He does, in fact, I have told you before. That the covenant that Abraham stepped into, it was first his father, Terah, that God wanted to hand that thing over to. So it's because Terah lost his son and God, I'm glad I'll go into that with you. And he just got, you know, distracted with the whole thing. That's why God came to Abraham and said, okay, I'll start with you. So God is a generational God. And when we, when, if you want to be a, a, a man that is biblically a five-star man, you have to have that understanding. Exodus 4 verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. In other words, we are saying that God's plan for you is too big for your own lifetime. The plan that God has for you, when I'm saying look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, 20 years down the line, 50 years down the line, you are thinking about not just your children, but your children's children. You are thinking about the legacy that you are going to leave behind. And legacy is not a thing that you start thinking about when you are 50 or 60 years old and you say, oh, I'm about to die. You start thinking about it from the day you know how to think. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's when you start thinking about that. That's when you start planning to say, okay, this is what my children will be. This is how it will be. This is how, look, before, some, some people ask me, like, you know, they, they, they say, oh, your children, your children have compound names. Not because I don't know that in Canada you should give them fine, fine names that people can pronounce. But that's not the legacy. They have to know where they came from. Uh-huh. Because my children are not Tom and Jerry. No, they, they have to know where they came. Do you understand what I'm saying? They have to know where they came from. That name is hard to pronounce because they came from somewhere. Am I making sense? Yeah, they came from somewhere. So, so somebody asked me recently, why do they have your first name and your last name? I said, well, number one, my wife is the person that will explain that best to you. But I know that in the way I'm living my life right now, in another 50 years, it doesn't make sense to you now, but that name, Sheol Salami, will be worth a lot. It will be worth so much that they can literally go into a place and say, I am Fimidara Sheol Salami. And they, they will ask them, which Sheol Salami are you? Is it that same Sheol Salami? Take it. That's the legacy I'm building, and it's a conscious thing. It's not a game. <laughs> you are not gambling. So as you are doing that, you know that every action you take, you have already staked the future of your children on the name you are building. So you can't be doing rubbish. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yes. This is what I'm saying to you. This is how to be a patriarch. This is legacy. So you are, you are, you are consciously 
living your life with an understanding that I'm not just, I'm a custodian of the name for the future of my children, my children's children. This is what it means to be a patriarch. And this is a biblical standard for a man in the scripture. So all you do, look, the funny thing about it is, whether it is good or evil, whether it is good or evil, you are going to unfortunately hand that down to your children's children. Numbers chapter 14. Some of you are not happy. So let me show you the Bible. Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. So he has told us that God is a good God. He is long-suffering, abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. So the same way he can, he can pass down his long-suffering uh, abundance of, of mercy you know, and all of that to the fourth generation is the same way that you can pass down. The, they are telling you, get rid of this. This is not a good thing. Take this out of your family. You are, where it's not just for you. It's because you are first in line. You are literally going to pass that thing down through your, your bloodline. And there are certain things that you have to say no to in your own time and say, no, 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 no. This thing is not going to go beyond me. I come from a long line of, of, of Muslims. So in case you have not noticed, my last name is Salami, but it's not the sausage. Because Canadians think that, you know, I, I use it as a joke a lot. When people want to spell my last name, they say, what's your last name, Salami? They say, I like the sausage. They like, ha, 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 ha. They say, but they don't understand that. It's good. It gives me a, a decoy. But it's from a long line of Muslims. Of, if I, I was a Muslim till I was 10 years old. So it's, I understood the whole thing. My mom, my father, everybody. Now everybody is now a Christian. But there are certain things that, that come with that line. That I had to say, my, even my younger brother, got, he got it at some point. I, don't, I didn't have to explain it to him, but he, too, he understood that he has, at the point, you have to create your own line to say, this is, this is who we will be known as. That's why all of us have our first name in front of our last name, so that they know that we may be salami. We are not going to throw it away, but we are not that kind of salami. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In, case, in case you don't know, there are some people that the only reason why they are still practicing that religion today is because it permits you to have multiple wives. Ah. Oh. Some of you might not want to visit Nigeria again now after all these things that I'm telling you. I still want you to go. But these are the, the realities of things. So they practice polygamy. And they, 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 in fact, some of them know that there are so many things about the religion that, that are not okay. But that ability to, to marry more than one wife, they treasure it above all the other things. So they, they stay there. Yeah. They, they, so for me, that, at a point, that had to, come to, had to come to a place where, whether by, by you know, the devil is very, very dubious. So whether by legit or by hook or by crook is not going beyond my, my line. This is where it stops. Uh -huh. This is where it stops. Uh, and, and we saw it too. Even my, my father, the devil tried him. Because you know you say you want to become a Christian. The devil will, will push some things your way. Tried him. Uh -huh. so, so for me now, I've told myself, whether you, you, you win that war or not, it will not go beyond my own line. This is the end of it. And there are certain things that you must stand firm like that concerning your line. Now I'm talking about where me, I'm coming from. Here in Canada, there are things that we deal with that are handed over from one generation to generation. Don't, don't lay hold on it. Don't say, uh, my, my, my dad had PTSD. My, my great granddad had PTSD. Come from a long line of PTSD. Ah. <laughs> don't make a room for it in your house now. No. Don't say, ah, this is, ah, this must be my grandfather's depression that is coming back on me now. You know, when we get to the age of 50, we all start experiencing post -trait. Ah. You have to put an end to the stuff. In your own line, you say, because if you don't do it, it will continue on like that. Yes. Let me not start preaching a revived type of message now. Let me stay with my message. So, a five, a five star man is very conscious about legacy, conscious about the heritage for his generations to come, and is not waiting until old age to begin to affect these things. And then, only men who follow a legacy are actually able to leave a legacy. So, you have to, you have to know and appreciate the legacy you are carrying in order to pass it on. So if you are not even, you don't stand for anything, there's nothing for you to pass down. If you are just going with the crowd, going with the flow, whatever they say is the new thing, or, or political correctness or whatever, let's just do what everybody does. No, you have to understand who you are. Understand what you stand for, because that's what you're going to pass down to your line. And if you, if you don't like the legacy that has been handed over to you, you have every right to rebuild it. There is nothing that says that uh, this, is the, this, is what, this is what we, have, we are in my family, this is what we have always been. And, you know, no, 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 if you don't like it, there is always the opportunity to rebuild it. I like what the centurion said to Jesus. He said, I'm a man under authority. 
So I, I know how authority works. If, you, if, you, if, you, if I say to my, my servants, come, they have to come. So if you are, you are somebody that is under authority, you will understand how to pass down authority. Uh, because again, one of the biggest issues with men is that men don't like to be coached. Men don't like to be told what to do. But unfortunately, there is nothing like greatness without a coach. Did you hear what I said? There is nothing like greatness without a coach. In fact, in fact sometimes the, the coaches are not as good as the players. They are not as rich as the players. You guys don't know these things. Is it strange what I'm saying? In any sport, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. The coaches are, they, they might not even be as popular. They might not be anything. And, and this comes with any sport. Swimming, tennis, everybody has a coach. If you find somebody who is great, they, they, and they, they know that this is not about me, they will tell you who their coach is. Some of them are, 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 like I said, they are not as rich as the players, but they are paid handsomely because they understand that uh, there are so many things that I can do as, with talent and skill. But there is the part of somebody else who sees the bigger picture than what I see and is able to help me along that line. This is one of the ma major areas where men fall short because men, men don't, don't like you say, ah, my, my mentorship. Ah, I, don't want, I don't want anybody to be telling me what to do. I know what I'm doing. Sometimes, like I've told you, sometimes you, you pick up things from, you, 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 we're talking about having a vision, having a direction. If your, your priesthood is not yet solid, it's not what it is. By, by being around other people who, who know what, the, where, what they are doing, where they are going, you start to catch a vision just by hanging around them. And this is how this works. So you are more likely to produce a good less legacy by following godly leadership, by, by, by being around people who have a good legacy and who are working towards it. Uh, and, and I've told you many times, not all of these men are perfect. All of these people that, that you know, and people get criticized. They talk about this. Ah, why do you like this person? Don't you hear that he, he, he's this? I say, that's what you heard. Uh -huh. Me, I'm keeping my eyes on the positive things that I'm learning from him. Not all of those things that you're talking about. All right. So people who don't follow godly, godly leadership, they always turn to idols eventually. Let, let, let me just leave that alone for now. Let's go to point number four. All right. Point number four is a, a five-star man is a provider. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend some time here. First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. First Timothy five, verse eight. We're talking about a five-star man and the five things that biblically define a man. Here's what it says. But if anyone does not provide for his own. You know, somebody was arguing one time. You know, sometimes when people just want to criticize, they, they get blind to the truth. So somebody was arguing that. Uh, he says yeah, if anyone does not provide for his own, uh, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith. It's worse than an unbeliever. That he's not talking about a man. Doesn't mean that only a man can be a provider. So I said, please read. Read it to me. He says, but if anyone does not provide for... Yes. You say, oh, oh. You know, because sometimes you can get so carried away with trying to be a critic that you just lose sight of things. It's very clear. There's no, you know, when you don't find a man in his place, a woman can take that place. But biblically, there are roles that have been given. Now, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you that, okay, if you, you got married, you know me, I'm not against inter-tribal inter marriage. I'm not against age marriage. Or I'm not against it. My wife, as you're saying, she's one year older than I am. So I have no issue with you marrying somebody that's older than you. I mean, even if you are 10 years old apart, I don't care. As long as your motive is right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Me, I don't care. Uh, the other pastors, they can't care. But me, as you see me like this, I'll come and do your wedding. I don't care. Uh -huh. Motive is the most important thing. But what happens is when people get into those kind of things, they say, ah, but my wife has all this money. I don't have to do anything. Ah. Look, no matter how much money a woman has, your wife can be earning more than you. There's nothing wrong with that but you must be bringing something to the table. That is your biblical role, your biblical responsibility. You have got to be bringing something to the table. I know all the men will not be happy with me after today, but it's, it's what it is. There's, nothing, there's no other way to explain it. And in this culture, there are so many, you know, there are so many loopholes around this thing. You say, uh, come, uh, let, let's, uh, we, we, are, we are living in the same house, uh, so we share the rent, so we share the mortgage. So the first payment will come out from my salary, then the second one will come out from your salary. And, blah, 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 blah. and you are the man of the house, and you have the, you have the means to actually take on more responsibility, but you are shedding more of it to, to the... I'm, I'm telling you what... It, you can frown at me, that's your problem. I'm telling you what the Bible says. It is your responsibility as the man. The woman was made to help you. This is not uh, about African culture, it's biblical culture. Biblical stuff. So this has nothing to do with, but you're saying that because you're from Africa, you know, all this African culture, you know, they always say that the man is this. Look, you can be doing uh, 2024 uh, feminism. 
Feminism has never changed the Bible. You can argue. You can do it. Like my wife always jokes that when they say women liberation, I say, me, I'm not bound, though. So nobody's liberating me. <laughs> That's what she always says. Let me move on. Proverbs, you are not, I can see you are not happy with me. So let me just move on. <laughs> Proverbs 13, verse 22. A good man, he says, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man, he says, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So he's not just talking about providing in the immediate. He's talking about long term. He's thinking beyond just him and, and where he is right now to how are my children's children going to be when I'm gone? That's a good man. Do you understand what we're saying? That is the way a good man thinks. He's thinking beyond himself, thinking way beyond that. So, so, so if, if you are going to leave an inheritance for your children's children, then you know you have to manage your finances properly. You know you cannot just buy everything you see. You can't just go on every vacation. You can't just, you get what I'm talking about? This is how all of these things begin to add up. That if you stay with the word of God and look at how the Bible defines things, your life will be in order. It will be. Start with the priesthood. Get a sense of direction. Right? And understand that you are leaving a legacy behind and you are, you are the provider. That is your biblical role. You can start with, with little things, with contributing, but you have to understand that that is the biblical role that God has given you. You provide for your immediate family. You provide for generations after you. And to be a provider... This is where it gets very, very challenging because to be a provider, you have to be good with either hand. I, I will explain what I'm saying, okay? I will explain that. Uh, Psalm 1, 144 verse 1 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hand for war and my fingers for battle. So when we say a provider is, is, is willing to fight with either hand, it means anything short of sin I'm willing to do in order to provide for my household. It might not be what is ideal for me in terms of, you know, Again, I always, I always talk from where I am from. Um, and I, I was saying on Wednesday that a lot of us, because we grew up here in Canada, and this is the blessing of having a pastor like me, okay? Because, yeah, yeah you, you can't find, look, my blend is very good. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have, I have balanced exposure in everything. See, when I first came to this country, I was coming from, from a place where I had my own business. Um, I was employing five people, three people full-time, two people part-time. I was doing well. I didn't have, like, I didn't have any, I was okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? I was fine. Uh -huh. I didn't have any problem. Then you come to a new country, and you start applying for a job, and it's like, you know, it was later that I realized, and this is funny, but this is a different story. This is for Advanced Summit, not for Sunday message. But it's later I realized that it was actually because my name was too long, and they could not pronounce it, that they were not calling me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate, but that's what it was. It, was, it, was, it took an employment agency to, to point that out to me, to say, that, why do you think it's I calling me Sean? You think Sean is my, the name my mother gave me? You just came out from the womb, like, you said, your name shall be Sean. No. no. It was then that they, they told me that you need to put an, uh, a pronunciation of your, of your name so that they, they, they find it easy to pronounce it. That's when I started getting people responding. I'm telling you. So, so I looked for a job like, no, look, it was a full-time job. I, look, I, I always joke about it, but if people think I'm exaggerating. I sent more than 100 CVs looking for jobs. I was just looking for jobs left, right, and center. But at the end of the day, the, the, the first opportunity that came was not this grand opportunity. It was not. It was, I was actually, after I, I take my wife to, to our, our office, I'll come back home doing nothing. One whole year, I was just sitting at home doing nothing. Thank God I still had some of my Nigerian things that I was doing, just doing all my, my publishing and printing things. The woman that, was, that lives across the road from us uh, saw me one day just coming back from dropping my wife. I was just out there washing the car because I had nothing to do. So I'll come outside in front of the house, just be washing car or doing something random, right? And she came to me and said, I always see you, you know, just coming around, like you're just, you know, doing this. I, I have a job, but, you know, I don't know because I've been looking at you. I don't know that this kind of job, you know, can you do it? When she told me the job, you know, normally you would say me. You know, you look at her and say, have you looked at me? Me. You're yeah, asking me this one. I said, ah, look, I, I will do it to anything. That anything, I will do it because I don't, I don't want to be sitting down at home. I want to, at the end of the month, be able to say, because I understand that this is my role. I have to be able to say, this is my own contribution. Because, you know, back then, uh, Naira to, to dollar was um, 200 at that time. Now, yeah, that was a good time, right? Yeah. yeah. Now it's like 800 and something. Like, if you get the best, it's like 800 something. So you can imagine the, the conversion. People are shaking, it's not, Pastor, it's not 800. So it's almost 1,000. <laughs> officially, officially, okay? So, so there's, a, there's a limit to how much your Naira, converting your Naira to dollar can go. So at that, I had already exhausted all my money. I had done everything. I took the job because 
it gave me the opportunity to at least step out of the house, go and engage myself, make some money, and put, look, that money, I, I, I've said this so many times, I'm just sharing these stories for the benefit of those of you that are new. The money that they were paying me in that salary is not up to what the government collects as by taxes now. That was my annual salary. It's not even up to it at all. It's not even that. Maybe they are close. So, so I'm telling you, where you start from is not the issue. But you must be willing to work with either hand. You can't say, ah, uh, in Nigeria, I was into IT. I'm only looking for an IT job. Yeah, the IT will turn around to TI. <laughs> so you, at the end of the day, you have to find what is... You, can't remember, you have to find what, what is available. Put your foot through the door. When you sit down there and say, it's only, it's, I, I will show you a scripture in the Bible that really, really explains this. I will just try to, to make it quick. Um, there's a fascinating story here in Judges chapter 20. I don't have time to really explain this to you, but the bottom line of this is that there was a civil war in Israel, believe it or not. The, the, tribes were, the, tribes, the whole tribes of Israel were fighting against the tribe of Benjamin because one, one brother from Benjamin went to go and tamper with another person's wife in another tribe. Uh -huh. Please tell the man beside you, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not good. It's a recipe for disaster. So there was civil war. That's the summary of all this. Go and read that and you will enjoy it. But I want to point something out to you here. Judges chapter 20. So there, there was a battle. The, 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 the Benjamites were fewer than the, the whole of the tribes of Israel. But they were killing the Israelites like it was no, no man's business. In two days, Israel lost 40,000 men. Just fighting with a, a minority number. But, but this is where I really want to point, draw your attention to. Another day, I will, I will, I will go into this in full. And from their cities, verse 15. At the time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword. They were fighting against 400,000 of Israel. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who numbered 700 select men. Among all these people were 700 select men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Now, besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. But like I've just told you, if you go into the story and you read it properly, you will find out that they kept losing. The first day after they, they lost, like, the, the first one was 22,000. They went and they prayed to God all night. Because after, you know, there's no floodlight. So when the battle reached night, everybody will go into their corner. So they went to pray that, God, what's going on? That we are, we are more than them. Why, why are they defeating us? God said, keep fighting. Because they were trying to wipe out evil from among them. What they were doing was wrong. But there was, there was a skill involved in what was going on. The second day, they lost 18,000. That's when they calmed down. That, okay, something must be going on here. So that's when I started to pay attention to that. Okay, what's going on here? Then it, it says to us that, from verse, verse 16, that among these people were 700 select men who were left-handed. Now, you might look at that and just gloss over it, but you know me, I don't gloss over the Bible. So I started to study it out, and I started to look for information about this. Okay, what's going on here? I heard some of the things that my, my pastors had shared about this, and I looked into some, some things. You know, if you study this out, what was going on here was that these guys who were 700 that were left-handed, they were actually not born left-handed. So the commentaries will say something like, they were, they were, they were 700 left-handed who were no longer right-handed. In other words, they had been fighting before with their right hand. Please pay attention to it. If this is the only thing you hear me say today. They got wounded while fighting with their right hand. They said, give us some time. We will get healed. Then we will go and learn how to fight with our left hand. Because every time they were training for battle in those days, everybody was training to fight with a right-handed person. So nobody understood how to fight with a left-handed person. That's why they were dying. That thing you are calling your weakness may be your greatest advantage. Are you listening to me? That you are saying, ah, what is this among so many? That might be the thing that God wants to literally use to elevate you in this place. And you are sitting down there saying, this is the only thing I know how to do. You've got to be able to fight with either hand. With either hand. Whatever, whatever the scenario is, whatever the case may be, I'm going to show up. And I'm going to do battle. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's tie it up. Let me get to my final point. Has this been helpful to you at all? I told you that whether you are a man or a woman, or you'll, be, you'll be blessed. If you listen, you will. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Point number five. A five-star man is a protector. A five-star man understands his role as protector. Leave the, leave the stealing, killing, and destroying to Satan. That's his job. It's not your job. John 10.10 10 says the thief is the one that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Your job is to be like Christ, which is to give life and give it more abundantly. So if the enemy is stealing anything, killing, destroying, your job is to stand in the gap. 
Ezekiel 22, verse 30. I always share this whenever we pray. It says very clearly, so I sought for a man. I sought for a man among them who will make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. Without a functional priesthood, it's almost impossible to be a protector. So everything we are talking about, if you are not the kind of person that understands that, at first, I have to be someone who has a relationship with God. That's where all of these things come from. I, I'm standing before God as a priest, then as a protector. Not with your weapons of war, but we're talking about being able to, to be in a place of prayer and intercession. This is one of the biggest things about, about learning to fight with either hand. So, there are some men, you are listening to me today, you will, tell your, you will say it to yourself that, you know, I'm, I'm, for me, I'm the kind of guy that I can make money easily. Making money is not hard for me. I know how to do business. I know how to do all that, all that thing. The only problem is if you put a Bible in front of me, I can't explain anything. And there are some others that, you know, they grew up in church. They are, they are good when it comes to Bible. They can pray Jim, Jim, Jim. You know, Jim, Jim prayer. Now the ground will be shaking. Jim, 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 Jim. You can pray that one. But put them out there and say, go and market something and make money. You say, ah, let me be influencer on social media. So you have to be able to balance things out. To say, okay, I'm not just going to be, you know, a man that I'm good with my, with my money, but I, I don't know how to live with another person. So if you are honest, some of, some of you, I'm, I don't want to say some of you, but, but you know what I'm saying. The reason why you can't, you can't commit to a relationship is because you are just afraid of exposing yourself to someone. You don't want, you're, you're like, ah, so I'm, I'm going to have to, to be honest with somebody and be open. The more we talk about the fact that you have to be open and honest in marriage, the more you say, ah, that marriage thing might not be my own. Uh, I, can't, I don't even know how, where to start from, all right? And, and this, is, this, is, this is important. This is very, very important. So a five-star man is a protector. Many men who are, who are weak, and what we do is that when we find an area where we, we feel like we are strong, we double down on that. Then we start to play down the areas where we are not. Uh, we start to, to, to almost make it look like, man, that doesn't really matter. You know, all of you are just pursuing money. I, I'm, I'm a man of faith. The ones that are pursuing money are saying, you know, you are just doing church, 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 but you need money to, to you know, my, my pastor has a joke that he always shares that when he was starting a ministry when he was starting out in ministry, that there was a fellow that he wanted to come and join him to do the ministry. That the guy told him, he said, let me tell you, you are the one that God called. You are a pastor. Go and do your pastoring. Me, I'm going to go out there and make money. Proper money. I'm going to be a millionaire before I'm 30. This way, they were in school, though. They were teenagers. I was telling him, I'm going to be a millionaire before I'm 30 years old. But this is my commitment to you. So he showed him David in the Bible. Showed him the scripture. said, those that go to the battle and those that stay by the baggage, they shall share alike. That's what the Bible says. My pastor always says that that was the guy that showed him that revelation. He had no, this is uh, someone that you would say unbeliever. He's just looking for money. He said, they shall share alike. So what I'm going to tell you is, go and start out your ministry. But as long as I am a millionaire, you will be seeing my hand. You know, in Nigeria, we say, see my hand. It's not physical hand. <laughs> it's hand in the bank. Uh -huh. And he says, he says, even till now, after all these many years, that the guy is still one of the biggest givers in their church. Like he went out there, he's now a millionaire by any standard, without any currency. But he still, he still keeps that commitment to say, I'm not going to come and be preaching with you. You preach, but when you look back, you will see me. <laughs> yeah, so some of us might not, might not be, you know, you're not this, but you must be useful. This is what we're saying. You have to be useful. You have to, you have to find your place. And the areas where you are, you are weak, you must strengthen those. Because you don't know which hand you're going to need. You don't know where it's going to be useful for you at the end of the day. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right, let me find a way to tie this up. Psalm 1, Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. So I started with the story of the, of the axe head, and I, I was saying that I'm going to tell you where that, where that comes to play. And we, we've established that all of this begins with priesthood. Therefore, that axe head that we read in that scripture, what it actually represents is the anointing. It is the anointing to function effectively as a man. And when we say the anointing, again, don't hear church. The priesthood guarantees that that, that, that anointing is is a tool for you to be effective in whatever your hand finds to do. Whatever it is, whatever field you are in, whatever industry you are in, it is how you are going to be effective. Without it, what, what you are going to... So, so you have, you have an, uh, an axe, which is wooded, and there is an axe head, which is the metal thing that's supposed to help chop down wood. But you don't have the axe head, and you are trying to cut down a wood. What you are going to end up with is a bruised hand and a wounded tree. And this is what's going on with a lot of us, that we're just, we're just making all that effort, but it's not, it's not yielding any result. Because that, that what, what makes things effective, it is the blessing of God that makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. It is, it is that axe head that is the advantage, that is the anointing that, that makes the difference. 
And you can only find that in the right location. That's why we're going to Psalm, Psalm 1. Because in that story you saw, it asked them, the first thing it asked them was, where did it fall? In other words, what's the location? And that was the place where he dropped the wood before the, the, the axe had uh, floated. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. This is the location. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaves also does not wither. And whatever he does, whatever, he, not what he went to school for, whatever he does shall prosper. Glory to God. Let's give God a moment.